This is the kissing gate of St Kineburgers Church here in the village of Caster in Cambridgeshire. And it's one of the most beautiful medieval churches in England. And yet it's what's under this church's graveyard that's got our archaeologists very excited because beneath my feet could be the remains of a mysterious Roman building. But it's not just one Roman building by itself. Over there in the school playing field, across there in the rectory. In fact, everywhere I look, archaeologists have found impressive Roman structures. This could add up to be something very special. Looks like it's going to be a hectic three days. That is, if I can never get down again. Is that Roman? <laughs> Already, pieces of Roman mosaic flooring called tessera are turning up. Back outside, it's now raining cats and dogs on our archaeologists in Trench One. <laughs> Thank you so much. But despite the weather and the geophys results, this trench is turning into something of a gold mine. We got some finds for. We're getting loads of finds out already. This is just a selection. There's this stuff, which is kind of Saxo-Norman, dates the 11th, early 12th century, around about the time the church was built. So they were quite possibly robbing out the Roman buildings for stone to build the church. And we've got our first bit of early Middle Saxon handmade pottery. Five, six, seven centuries, something like that. What about this chunky stuff here? Well, we've got Roman as well. There's some bits of Roman colour-coated pottery, which is late third, fourth. Bit of a mosaic tessera as well, possibly. Cracking selection of finds already. It looks like there's something coming out of the trench field. Yeah, well, this is the crucial thing, Tony. As Paul says, we are beginning to get Saxon pottery. These are the first levels that we're actually coming down onto. They could include Saxon buildings here. This is really rather extraordinary for us. We always have a problem finding Saxon on time team. To find it, great, but then to find it on the site where we're looking for Roman is a little bit more difficult. What do we find next? So we're going to open our second trench here in the old rectory garden. And after some promising geophys, we've decided to put a third trench in this corner of the school field. This is another spot that our antiquarian artists and later archaeologists have explored. And it seems to have been an artist's favourite, because he drew the remains of this impressive Roman bathhouse he reckoned he'd found here. If so, our trench in the old rectory garden could be right on top of one. But if Artis's plan is accurate, it's the north graveyard where we really need to focus our efforts. So Jim is now geophysing here. And by mid-afternoon, he's latched onto something. Um, you've turned up just at the right time. Look at this. We've got a really strong reflector here and it's at least five metres across. Well, that's nothing like anything else in the churchyard, is it? No, no, up until now, I mean, there's been the odd reflection, but they've looked like um, they could just be stone casket or a slab-lined grave. But, I mean, this is much, much bigger, and it's about halfway up the slope, just beyond where this mess is. Well, this is where the one building was meant to be from antiquarian records, where they got this early mosaic. It's possible Jimmy's detected this striking Roman yeah. mosaic floor that artists drew in his book of illustrations. And if our antiquarian site plan is to be trusted, it makes sense that geophys are getting a strong signal here. There must have been something here for them to rob and raid to use. Yeah. What are yeah. you guys doing here, all the excitement, on the far side of the church? You're stuck round the back. Yeah, but we've been looking at all the Roman stuff built into the church, the tile and the stonework and so on, and the idea that it comes from a huge Roman building that's somewhere round here at the back of the church. Artists had a theory that all the Roman buildings to the north of the church were one giant structure. And Stephen thinks this is how it might have looked. Well, it's a pretty enormous building, Tony. I mean, from where we're standing to the far side, it's 110 metres. Crikey. Well, if it's that big, it would absolutely dwarf the church, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. It would be three or two or three times bigger than the church. So what could something that size actually be? Let's go back to Artis. He called it a praetorium. What's a praetorium? Well, in artists' terms, he were used to digging villas of fairly modest size, and this was the biggest thing that he ever saw and ever dug. And he gave the term praetorium, implying its size. We've only got one day, Ben. Yeah. What do you think our overall strategy should be? Well, I think Artis was a very good archaeologist for his time, but I'm, I'm not so confident about this sort of floating building here. Yeah, Is yeah. it attached to the other buildings around it? What 
alignment is it on? We need a trench across there to try and yeah. tie it to the other buildings and sort out the alignment. Yeah. Then I think we need to do something similar in the west part of the churchyard, just here. Now, a few That's years where you can see that wall in the path. Yeah. Well, yeah. a few years ago, I cleaned up a bit of wall there, and there's definitely something there, but I didn't yeah. get much of a look at no. it. Is that a big building range as artist depicts it? And I'm off up there now. <laughs> so Phil's on the move to this spot just north of the church to help Jackie dig a new trench in the graveyard. And Rakshar's opening a trench as well in the area that Ben's interested in. With over 20,000 burials in this churchyard, it's not going to be easy finding any evidence for our praetorium. But in the rectory garden trench, which Faye's now taken over from Matt, we may be onto something. What have you actually got going on over there, Tim? Well, I seem to have this surface. It's got a few tesserae in it, but it's very pebbly and not very good. Now, that's what's interesting, because where I am, I've got nothing. I've got a great big rectangular hole with no archaeology in it, and my only explanation for that can be that this is where Artis shoved his trench, and he basically took everything away with him. And therefore, that's why we've got this line along here, which I think is a robbed out wall. Everywhere on this site, we seem to be following in the footsteps of this chap, Artis. Some of us, quite literally. I need some measurements from this line now so I can put them on the drawing. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, beg your pardon. You're on time, How? Matthew. I think the peg's come out. Who put the peg in, Matthew? Sorry, sir, it went up and again. That's your wages, Dot. Yes, Mr Ainsworth. Right, next, the rectory garden next, Matthew. Anything you say, Mr Ainsworth? <laughs> Back in the graveyard, Phil and Jackie are up against the clock, digging carefully around lots of human bones. They've now only a few hours left to get down to the floor of a potentially massive Roman structure. Are these individual burials or are they lots of bones on top of each other? Well, we've, we've had a lot of loose bones spread about, turning up all the way across here. But the difference here is, you can see we've got about five skulls all dumped in together in one place. So you do think that that could be a grave digger who's cleared earlier graves, dug a pit, chucked these in so that more people can be buried? Yeah, I mean, basically, it looks like a charnel pit. But we do have a problem, don't we, that we've got lots of bones and lots of smashed mosaic, but no structures whatsoever. What we can be certain of is that in places, the grave diggers have been through the Roman floor. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this sort of material. What we've got to hope is that they didn't destroy it all and that they've left some of it for us. And that means digging deeper? That means digging deeper. Thankfully, Rakshar's trench at the western end of the graveyard looks to have got something more substantial. Oh, How's it going? It's going very well, actually. Um, put this trench in here to find what we thought was a wall coming through yeah. there. And uh, lo and behold, we have a huge wall. <laughs> that was actually poking out of the ground before was, you started, wasn't it? was, wasn't we it? knew that was there, but I didn't <laughs> realise how massive it actually is. So we've got one wall here, mm -hmm. which is in running in that direction, and then where John is, we have the return, and that's running in this direction. So they should actually come out and converge around about here. It's amazing, isn't it? This is the first time that we have seen anything like the kind of monumental walls that Edmund Artis saw. Yeah, this is the, this is the only trench where we actually have huge walls. Mm, mm. In the old rectory garden, where we're looking for what could be the east wing of our praetorium, we now have two trenches. But our main hopes lie with these trenches in the graveyard. Rakshars at the western edge, and Phil's just north of the church. Phil, you know how I said I was getting a lot more building material and big blocks of tessera? Oh, wow. Uh. Now I'm getting lots of pea grit, which is coming, this fine grit, and look what it's coming down onto. Oh, good lord. That looks like a floor. It looks very like a floor. And this is an in situ burial. That's lying directly on top of it by the look of it. <laughs> Oh, that is good stuff. And I'll tell you what... Blimey. We could be just inches away from finally getting evidence of a big Roman structure. And crucially, it's slap bang in the middle of our Praetorium plan. Back in the old rectory garden, Faye's getting really stuck in. Cool, Hiya. this looks a bit different to yes. yesterday. You're well down. I am, 
but fantastically we've got a huge great big section of it's wall. It's a big Roman wall isn't it? <laughs> yeah without a shadow of a And we were a bit worried yesterday about the sort of relative heights of all this. I mean there's a, there's a surface very much higher than the Roman wall. You can see where artist put his trench which is basically this line down in this section here. And I actually think that level there is where he was standing. <laughs> really? Yeah, which is why it's so compact. With footprints? Zoom what in, size boots did he have? Come You're on, so come demanding. on. so demanding. I haven't got any <laughs> footprints in there. And it's also a very significant chunk of walling on the eastern side of what we think is one single enormous building. Faye's discovery of this massive Roman wall, previously dug by artists, is a really good sign. Maybe we can rely on our antiquarian after all. Meanwhile, there's breaking news from the graveyard. We've spent the last 36 hours poking around in this graveyard, trying to get permissions to dig it, getting permissions to dig it, then finding nothing but Roman rubble and a tumble of old bones. But at last, Phil, we've got something exciting, haven't we? We have got Artis's floor. Look, if you look down between that pair of legs, you can see a mosaic floor actually in situ. You're smiling, William. I'm really excited about this. If artists are right about this, he might be right about the Praetorium. Here we are. They took Jesus from the house of Caiaphas, esto Praetorium, to the Praetorium. In artists' day, he would have heard the word Praetorium when he went to church, because that was the word used to describe them where Jesus was arraigned in front of Pontius Pilate. So he was tried in the Praetorium? In the Praetorium. But but go on. I was going to say, this is so important to what we're trying to do. We've now got the floor. You can actually begin to see some sort of an alignment on the tessery. We might be able to actually say exactly what the alignment of that building was. Finally, our efforts in the graveyard are being rewarded. Raksha, this is awesome. I love this. <laughs> this is fantastic. It looks a lot different than it did yesterday. It, it, it is. It's a lot, lot different. Rakshar's revealed a huge section of wall and a step foundation. The classic herringbone style shows that this is definitely Roman. People were a bit sceptical yesterday. I talked about finding this big herringbone wall and I, I suspect that people didn't quite believe me. <laughs> This looks remarkably similar to what was found on the other side of the church in the 50s. Yes, I remember that. I've seen photographs. Of yeah, it. it's on a similar line, and he found step foundations like this. This is a photo of those step foundations excavated at Castor in the 1950s. They're more than 100 metres away from our trench, but they're virtually identical to those found by Rakshar. And as the last few hours of our dig at Castor tick by, the news just gets better and better. So what's the story of this trench then, Faye? Basically, we have a Roman building, and actually down there we've got a room with what looks like a hypercore system. We've actually got a two-level building. So what did they do? Fill it in or cover it up and then build something on top? Or they had stairs that took you up to another room. Ah, right, right, right. A building on two levels makes sense, because the Romans had to factor in the slope of a hill here in the old rectory garden and on the western side of the church. The massive Roman wall that Rakshar found at the western end of the graveyard, nearly two metres wide, was built to support a building possibly three storeys high. And at an extraordinary 110 metres in length, this is the largest Roman building Time Team has ever excavated. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Stilton sits just off the A1 near Peterborough, and it's close to the Neen Valley, a major centre of the Roman pottery industry for 250 years. So it's no surprise that the fields around this town have been producing bits of Roman pots, bowls and vases yeah. for years. Three, look at that. Four, who's just pieces all there's another one there. Yeah. There's a bit there, look. Oh gosh, yes. It hasn't come very far. It's not very braided, is it? No. But it's the sheer amount and quality of the finds coming out of these ditches that have really caught the team's imagination. So we're not wasting any time. 
as we're going to have to open a very big, very deep trench before we reach any archaeology. But if the previous finds are anything to go by, it'll be worth the effort. We were just about to do a scene about this coin that Philip has just found when there was a yell from over here. So let's have a look at this one too. Finds really are starting to come up, aren't they, Helen? Well, it's, I suppose it's, it's, it's... When you look very hard, you're going to find things on these interesting bumps of land. What's this one? It's a Celtic silver oh, unit. Oh, goodness me. Oh, fantastic. This Celtic or native British coin dates to the first century BC, suggesting there was trade, or at least activity, going on here at least a hundred years before the Romans arrived. And what's the coin that we were going to do a scene about? Well, it's silver and it's actually a penny, but for some reason we call them shatters or skeets these days. Uh, and it's one of the most common kinds of Series E, dates to the early 8th century, and they're found all over eastern England and Holland as well. Fabulous finds for so early in the dig, yeah. but do they actually tell us anything? Well, it tells us that activity stretches back a few hundred years before the Romans were here making pottery, and a few hundred years afterwards as well. So it looks like we'll have more than just the Roman archaeology to deal with here. I think the signal is so strong here that there was undoubtedly a kiln here. at this point. Boy. So could, could, could it be possible that the kiln has totally gone and what we're looking at is the clay underneath that has been heavily burned? It's possible, yeah. It'd be disappointing. But the real shock is in Trench 2, where we've just discovered the last thing you'd expect on an industrial site. Well, we definitely seem to have got the, uh, the shin bone here. But then look, a very nice set of metatarsals, yeah. which our footballers are very fond of breaking. What we seem to be missing in the middle is the whole of the, the, ribs. the ribs and the vertebrae, <laughs> which we definitely need. Because from the teeth wear, we might be able to say something about the age of the adult, and from the shape of the skull, we might be able to say something about its sex. Yeah. In fact, we seem to have two burials, as Matt's just uncovered some more bones at the other end of Trench 2. This site just gets curiouser and curiouser, and we now have two very different investigations on this small hill. So as the delicate unpicking of the burials gets underway, the more physical industrial dig continues with Phil and John opening a third trench over another anomaly that John's also convinced is a kiln. Look at this burnt clay that's coming around there, and it comes around there, back along there. It's just completely, well, I want to say it's nearly circular. It's unusual, isn't it? Well, it is. Over on the other side, they're still digging through metres of dark, thick clay. But over here, just inches below the surface, we've already got a really good archaeological story, haven't we, Matt? Yep, you can see we've got the second body here. Head to the west there, feet to the east. It's very delicate, very thin bone, so I'm thinking it's probably quite a young child or something like that. Um, we don't know the date of it yet, but it looks to me like it's cutting through these layers of all the pottery and bits of broken up kiln in it, so definitely post-Roman, post-kiln. So would your best guess be Anglo-Saxon? Could be, yep. And the first body is over here. You've got the skull! Yeah, it's a bit of a jumble mess because um, we've had a bit of plough activity in this region. But, um, you know, we've got the lower jaw and look at its teeth, it's fantastic. Kerry! Come over here, mate. So, what are you seeing on that level? What we've got is a much earlier uh, Roman surface, to, uh, well, at least one and a half, two metres below. And it's absolutely stuffed full of pottery. Wow. And that's from one sweep of the bucket. And that hasn't been broken by the bucket? No, nope, that's all breaks. You can see the dirt on the sides there. Francis, can you see it's got all this shelly stuff in it? Yeah, it used to add shell. It, it made the pottery dry better when mm. they were making it. So what's your strategy going to be now? What we're going to do is finish this and get up to the section there, then we'll clean it up and then we'll dig down into it. It's quite gracile, isn't it? It's not, it's not robust. It's, and this part of the mandible, it's not you know, really chunky or... Yeah. We've got no big kind of muscle attachments, no. have we? So if anything, that's looking more like a lady. But as we start to remove the skeletons from Trench 2, it becomes apparent that we haven't just got two burials, but the remains of up to seven different individuals, including children and babies. I just wanted to show you this. So I heard you talking about the teeth there. Can you see? Oh, wow. A molar popping through. So obviously it was a young child. I was wondering kind of what, how, how old that would be, what age that? Yes, look at that. 
you look at that tooth there, it's, it's very big. small, so that's you could almost say that is in its milk teeth still. I think that makes this as a pretty young. Yeah. About seven? About seven. seven. Yes. It's now clear that this was a significant Saxon site. The task for us is to try and work out what was happening here 300 years after the Romans left. I do think we have finally got the full extent of it. I reckon you're right. Thankfully, the Roman element of this complex field is beginning to make more sense. In Trench 3, Phil now has something that's beginning to look remarkably kiln-like. And now that the burials have been removed, we can also confirm that Trench 2 contains a kiln, although it seems to be of a different construction to the one in Phil's trench. I think what you've got, actually, Helen, is a stone-lined cut. In other words, it could be the, the actual chamber of a kiln. Oh. And this is the, like the stone lining for the cut. That's the kiln interior. Oh, and then you would have had the fire bricks or clay lining the inner face of that wall forming the actual furnace chamber for the kiln. It's now almost the end of day two, and it feels like we've got more to investigate than ever. And that doesn't even include the masses of newly uncovered archaeology in the ditch trench. Oh, crikey, look at that lot. You can see the amount of pot we've got yeah. crammed into the centre there. The other thing about it, not only is it a lot of pot, but you can see the dark colour of the soil. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of charcoal in there, and of course there's waterlogged wood in there. Not a lot, but it's there. Aye, that's quite incredible. I mean, it must mean there's a whole lot of stuff under this field, is not it? It's extraordinary. And this is the trench that everyone's getting really excited about. Yesterday they were speculating that in it is a Neolithic causeway enclosure, which is very, very rare. Francis has only ever discovered one in his life. Francis, now you've had a look at it, is this the second? Well, I'm very excited, Tony. First thing this morning, we found this superb Neolithic flint. It's beautifully sharp and, you know, I, I'm very excited about it. Well, I was for about 10 minutes. And then we found this. And this is a piece of Anglo-Saxon pottery. That's just as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> hang well. on, hang on, what are you saying? Are you saying it is a Neolithic ditch that's been reused in Anglo-Saxon times, or are you saying it's not Neolithic at all? I'm saying, if it was Neolithic and reused, I'd expect a great deal more flint than this. Um, I'm afraid, I think it's Anglo-Saxon, end of story. So why is that exciting? Well, because they don't turn up very often, and to actually have the ditch, we have post holes, we have barrels. It all starts to look like an Anglo-Saxon settlement. That's tremendously exciting. This is time, team. We find something we think is very exciting. It turns out to be something else. It's even more exciting. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's all right. Oh, look. Yeah. We've got some pots in There's there. Definitely pots oh, hiding yeah. in there, yes. Other parts of our investigation here have been more straightforward. Thanks to some experimental archaeology, we've now established that the local clays around Stilton were perfect for the Roman pottery industry. So how do you feel that went as a firing then, Rick? Well, as a piece of experimental archaeology, I think it's been very um, successful. Yeah. Back on the hill, more evidence from the Anglo-Saxon periods emerging. Brace yourself for treasure. Ta-da! Even I, as a Romanist, would recognise that as yep. a significant object. Absolutely. It may not Saxon be beautiful. Pinhead. Yep, Middle Anglo-Saxon, 8th, 9th century. Yeah. So it fits in brilliantly with the shatter Doesn't and it? with the pottery that seems to be coming out yeah. of the ditch, which is really tremendous. It's really That's exciting. Superb. I mean, I know it's building castles in the air, but an Anglo-Saxon ditch, a Middle Anglo-Saxon ditch round an island, yeah. it's beginning to look like, oh, could be a monastery. There are now all sorts of theories running around the site that we may have discovered a significant centre of Anglo-Saxon religion. Oh my goodness, what's that? What is that? It's another wall, and it's butting against the wall of the kiln. Somebody's built a wall into the kiln. My goodness. Hermits were effectively the first monks, and if this is a Middle Saxon hermitage, we found something incredibly rare because most hermitages now lie under some of Britain's most impressive abbeys and cathedrals. We know that the way the early church was organised, that's what people did. They went and lived miles from anybody else on retreat, we'd call it today, wouldn't we? Mm. Sort of, you know, in isolation. No, it is speculation, but it fits the archaeological evidence for that period. So, you know, I'm reasonably, reasonably confident that's what we've got. If it is a hermitage, how mm. important a site does it make it? Well, every so often we do a programme and I think what we find, that'll go into the textbooks, 
because it's a good example of this or a, or a better example of that. And I think this is one of those, you know. You've got an enclosure from the geophysics, you've got um, Saxon pottery, you've got burials, you've got post hole buildings. That's the sort of thing that's going to get mentioned in any discussion about this period or this topic. So I think it's one of those. In so many other places, this would have evolved into one of the great Saxon and medieval abbeys and monasteries of Britain. For some unknown reason, that didn't happen here, and as a result, we've uncovered the rarest of archaeological finds, a hermitage. And this site still offers more. As the end of the day approaches, it turns out that the Saxons and Romans weren't the first people to recognise the importance of this small Cambridgeshire hill. It's been a good day for you, hasn't it? You've got your kiln, you've got an Anglo-Saxon enclosure. Look what I've got for you. Another enclosure. Oh my God, look where, at that. Where, 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 where? Look, once you focus in on it, you can see it. If I turn it that way, it's like a pair of spectacles. But this is a double one on this side, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's your prehistoric one. So we're suddenly back into the Neolithic again. <laughs> it could be. It was the amazing amount of pottery in that field over there which led us to the kilns in this field here, which thankfully we found at last. But in fact, it was the discoveries on the final day that really got us excited. Not least the possible Anglo-Saxon hermitage complete with an enclosure. In fact, this whole story has gone from the Neolithic to the Anglo-Saxon and now in the final half hour back to the Neolithic again with John's Geophys and what we think is a Neolithic enclosure. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more and you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Welcome to Bedford Pearly Woods in Cambridgeshire. It's the kind of place you'd think would be the enemy of archaeologists because you can't see anything because of all these trees. But take a look at this. This stunning aerial picture was taken by firing lasers between the trees. It shows all the lumps and bumps. And you see this thing here? Could that be a building and another one there and there and there and there? So is this some kind of complex? Well, back in the 1800s, an antiquarian noted the remains of some Roman buildings in this wood and apparently some Roman statues nearby. So could this high-tech picture be showing us those remains and a lot more besides? Maybe some kind of extensive Roman settlement? Because in some places, we can actually see Roman walls on the surface. Look, this is silly. You can't have archaeology <laughs> just... It's sticking above the ground. Yeah. It's not under the ground. No doubt, this is why the site was first discovered by an antiquarian back in the early 1800s. And it's because the remains are close to the surface that they've also shown up so well on this LiDAR picture. The colours, by the way, represent height with green marking the low ground and white the highest. And we know that some of these buildings are Roman because a few test pits have been dug. But not enough to work out what was actually going on here. So we're opening these two trenches to try and solve the mystery. I think we've actually got a stone wall coming here. You can see there seems to be a face there. Yeah. I haven't quite got the other side, but I imagine that it pretty much stops at this side, just here. Right. Yep. And it follows the bank. Ah, oh. find. Ah. It's just a bit of uh, tile, isn't it? It's just in the rubble. See the line of the wall there? Oh, right, yeah. Well, I'd say it's a floor tile. That, looks, that looks like Roman floor tile, doesn't Roman it? Roman floor yeah. tile, yeah. Yes. Yep. Very Promising. Good. Very good. So Matt's wall is Roman. And I have to say, it does look suspiciously like it belongs to the same range of structures that Phil's digging some 80 metres away. Have a look at this wall. So crisp, so well made, so well defined. It just goes on and on in that direction and maybe in that direction too. And all the archaeology is just below the surface. Who knows what we'll find? Mind you, the way Phil's going won't be long before we find out. Helen, who was the antiquarian who came across this site a couple of hundred years ago? 
He was a chap called Edmund Artis. We've got a photo of him, amazingly. And he was a kind of gentleman archaeologist, antiquarian. He was actually interested in most things. He also was an expert on fossils and geology. And in 1828, he made this completely fantastic map of the area. And the bit we're interested in, our wood, is up here. Now, you can see we've got this lovely red horseshoe-shaped Roman building. And he's also put these brown dots on, which he codes as, as ironworks. And I think these must be uh, pits dug to remove iron ore. Did he actually do any digging? Well, I have been trying to find that out, and I can find no concrete evidence that he actually dug a hole. He, it may have been he just came past and saw earthworks or even standing buildings. Mm. Stuart, how does his map relate to what we can see on the ground? Well, I, I like it, I do, because when I came up here this morning and sort of walked through, I drew in my sketchbook a shape that looks exactly like that. This thing would have been visible when he drew it, it's still visible now. Isn't it a bit bizarre, though, that he's drawn this horseshoe building, bits of which seem to go under the road? Well, I mean, it's possible that when he came here that he could still see remains of, of bumps going under the surfaces of the road, as it were. But um, whether they carried on into this field, we'll never know, because if you look over there, it's been quarried out and now it's been used as landfill, so we'll never know whether these ranges actually extended into that area. Unfortunately, Edmund Artis never published his written reports, so I guess we'll be finishing the job for him over the next three days. And it looks like Geofiz may be able to help. They've managed to survey this clearing and have picked up strong signals to the edge of it, but annoyingly they can't go any further because of the trees. It's really frustrating. I mean, we're actually getting some good results, and you can see really strong responses. Like, I think they're probably actually metalworking, ironworking sort of responses, but they're just... I can't get that bigger picture. But noise is good. Well, ironworking suggests some sort of industrial activity, possibly a nearby furnace. It could also help explain all these pits dotted around the site. What we really need, actually, is a hey? You got a problem? Uh, well, not really a problem so much as we've got a load of rubble coming up again, just like Phil's trench. And what I need to know is whether I can get the machine in, take this down further, or whether you want us to do it by hand. Well, I think your problem is the route, isn't it? This is a national nature reserve, and we've agreed that we won't cut any roots more than one centimetre thick. Good news for the trees, bad news for Faye. So we can take out all the, the, the little rubbish, but just leave the one. Little rubbish. So, all this stuff that's vital for the growth of the tree. But know? Faye's going to have to dig it yeah. by hand. Am I digging underneath this big root then? Well, basically? you'll have to. Well, that's, that's, well, that's going to be interesting, isn't and it? And you'll have to do it by hand. Meanwhile, Matt's trench has done its job. It's shown that the Roman buildings extend along here and are all part of one settlement. So we're closing it down and packing Matt off to investigate this large earthwork. It appears to be a building that stands alone, which might mean it's important. But again, gardening comes before archaeology. So, as Matt gets his new trench started, I'm wondering if all the walls and tiles we're discovering means our mystery settlement is a Roman villa, exactly as Edmund Artis predicted back in 1828. So this is an original copy of the artist book that I've been looking at photocopies That's of. That's right, yeah, it's an original copy. And Artis certainly knew Roman, this massive villa was dug by him at nearby Castor. The artist talks about Castor as a major villa, mm -hmm. where he looks at Bedford Purlieu's as a second order villa. And that's a bit confusing, really. And I think probably the answer is that Castor is such an enormous site. And by comparison, what he saw of the Roman remains at Bedford Purlieu's was not unimportant, but lesser when compared with the villa at Castor. But in spite of Artis's description of a villa here, there may be a chance he got it wrong. I'm in two minds, actually. It looks as if it could be a standard Roman villa, but the plan is suspicious, and I suspect the linking with ironworking is very intriguing. Right. This is some stuff we found down the road, just in a cutting, oh. and you can see, feel the difference in waste. Look at the colours. Well, I, mean, I, could, I could spot that as yeah. I end straight away. That's, exactly. It's very different to that, isn't well, it? Well, this will occur in bands underneath this yeah. and stuff. So you've got to get this overburden off. <laughs> you've got to get through this potentially to, to get like that, have yeah, you? So, exactly, yeah, exactly, right. yeah. With so many pits to check, it looks like Roger will have his work cut out. But what I find most surprising is that we could have so much industry close to what we suspect is a villa. 
Interestingly, we're getting evidence that people lived and cooked in the buildings Phil's investigating. Oh, cracking. Absolutely yeah, cracking. What's it like on the other side? Get some of that muck off the other side. Oh, yeah, that is some pot, and it really, I mean, Absolutely look, you're gonna. Fantastic, isn't it? This mortarium would have been used for grinding food like corn or maize to make bread, and it suggests that we could be close to a kitchen. Look at all this brick and loads of tile. It's fantastic, yeah. Nick. This, this is hypercoarsed heating flue tile, look. With the, with the marks on it where the plaster sticks on. You've also got lots of roofing material. These are the, these are the, the clay tiles off the roof, one like that, and then a curved one over like that. So, you know, it's all looking much more like a, a sort of high status building than we thought. Is that painted plaster? Yeah, you've actually got stuff with patterns on it, look, and red patches, and there's even more coming out. Where Matt is, yeah. you've got more of it there, haven't you? There's actually a piece there in the top of this rubble layer with a black painted line across the top. You've got the trench of the day, without any doubt, haven't it's, you? It's coming up with the goods, isn't it? So it looks like we could have found the first evidence of a fancy villa here in Matt's trench. We could be thinking about we've got industrial activity here. You know, it's either some furnace or some oven or something like that, a kiln or something. Well, that's why we put the trench here. We yeah. wanted to know what was going on on the inside of the building. And you've nailed it. You've got, you've got something that's, that's giving us activity inside the building. What on earth is that then, Anthony? I have no idea. I've been trying to unravel it for the last 10 minutes. Um, but as the end of the day draws near, it looks like it's Phil's trench that's turned up the most intriguing find so far. Has that been worn by a rope? Round the well, top? Uh, no, I don't okay. think so. Is it a very weathered piece of a statue? Is that an arm going? Ah, well, oh, there well. you go, you see. I mean, it does make, does make you look. wonder whether that is some sort of an arm down there, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it does look else? like an arm. Well, we've got a nice yes. piece of what appears to be possibly a bit of carved stone. This? Is, well, yeah, but what you can't see, Tony, is that round here, yeah. it does look like an arm. It really does. I wouldn't mind. If it's Roman and it's carved stone, that would be a big one for us, wouldn't it? Yep. You were the one who was saying, oh, it's very rare to find things like it this. It is very <laughs> rare, but we have our occasional moments. Yeah. Don't you wish at a moment like this we were 19th century antiquarians? We could just tip it out, we'd actually find out what it is. What, rip it out yeah. without bothering about uh, well, the archaeology? <laughs> can I point out that thankfully we are not 19th century archaeologists, we are responsible 21st century archaeologists, we want to do this properly. Have you got no sense of tradition? No, Basically, have. Phil's telling us to clear off and come back when he's ready to lift this piece of stone and, crucially, when we'll be able to see the other side of what he's uncovered here. Meanwhile, carefully placed in between the ant's nest and the deadly nightshade bushes, Matt's trench is revealing the first glimpse of some sort of posh structure. Can you see the mortar yeah, there? Yeah, coming up, yeah. Yeah, look, there's the edge of another oh, one there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that could be a lead into a flue or something. So this would have formed some kind of floor heating or something like that? Yeah, if it's a hypercourse, yeah, there's sort of pili within the room itself. It begins to look ever, ever more structural. So what's it actually doing? Well, what it's doing now is shining x-rays onto the rock, and uh, the different elements in the rock will sort of uh, reflect those x-rays back. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the intensity of them, we can say what's there and how much is there. Right, so that's, that's nearly 50% oh, there. Good solid iron, that's it. It is, absolutely. I mean, that, that's almost pure iron oxide, really. Ah, if you look here, Stuart, look, we've got almost 2% manganese. What, what's significant about manganese? Well, manganese is one of those things which really helps slag form. It helps slag form, it helps it flow. Oh, I see. You see, and iron smelting is not just about uh, making iron. If you mm. can get your slag to flow nicely, it means your furnace keeps working, doesn't get all clogged up. Ah. So, this is fantastic ore, not just for its iron content, mm -hmm. which is very high. But also the other bits and pieces in with it, the other elements in with it, manganese. Fantastic ore to smell. Having established that the pits with the spoil heap around them are to do with mining for iron ore, we now want to check one of the other shallower pits, which could have been dug for a different purpose. Meanwhile, over at the posh end of the site, Matt's now extended his trench over the bathhouse and is making quick progress but ideas are changing. 
there are several things actually. I mean, um, one is that the, the orientation is wrong. It doesn't look like a, a, the plan of a villa that I recognise from elsewhere as a standard courtyard villa. Mm. The new theory is that this bathhouse is not part of a Roman villa, but built for a manager or overseer who was looking after the ironworks here. Is it possible that we're looking at some overseer here who's working on behalf of the state? Right. And the state, of course, I think, have a very, very large presence in the building underneath Castor Village. Oh, yes, yes. And it could be some procurator there who is not only superintending Fenland yeah. um, estates, but ironworking estates as well. Yeah. And how far is Castor? Castor's fantastic, because it's only a few miles, a few away, miles that away. away. And this was also excavated by our antiquarian. Artists spent many years excavating at Castor, where he found enormous building complexes uh, underneath the modern village. It's a good idea. Our site, controlled from Castor, could have been one of several iron production centres situated on the outskirts of Dura Breve, the main trading centre in the region. Ermin Street, the M1 of its day, literally ran through the town, and with the River Neen close by, iron could have been dispatched by road or river to almost anywhere in Roman Britain. And if this bathhouse was for an overseer, it looks like he lived in fine style, judging by these chunks of painted plaster that show the colour scheme of the walls of this building 1,600 years ago. It's a stark contrast to Phil's trench, where there's no sign of painted plaster or luxuries like underfloor heating. But we did find what looked like a carved stone here yesterday. And now that our experts have had time to carefully examine it, I'm curious to know what they think it is. It's a stone. A stone? A stone. But not just any random stone. Phil thinks it's been definitely shaped for some purpose or other. Take a look at this one here. Now that was found just outside in the angle of the walls there. Yeah. Look how that ordinary stone has been used as a whetstone to sharpen tools. And it just goes to show that every stone you find on a site like this, you have to look at it, think about it to make sure it's not an artifact. Thanks, I think that's a very good lesson to learn from someone who was sure that was a statue last night. <laughs> it looked very good at the time. <laughs> but at least Phil's trench and Faye's trench put in here have given us lots of useful detail about the actual buildings in this range. Basically, we've got a collapsed building. It's colourful, isn't it? It's great, isn't it? You can just see where you are there. You've got these collapsed stone, this stone wall, and beneath it, We've got this tile layer, which is our roof. Yeah. And then here, we've got more of this kind of collapsed roof building material. It's very black, isn't it? It is. I mean, this building's been burnt down. Right. Although there's a lot more to learn about this range, we now have some idea what these buildings look like. This is a reconstruction of the area where Phil was digging, which we now know was a series of rooms based around a courtyard. We think these were workshops or living accommodation for the people who worked here, a workforce probably of slaves, which would explain why we didn't find any coins or items of real value here. The question now is have we discovered the main iron smelting area up here on the slightly higher ground? Time's ticking away and Mick has called me urgently from over here somewhere because he desperately needs Roger, our man with the suitcase. What's the problem, Mick? We've got some material down here that we're not quite sure what it is. We need you to look at it, Roger, and tell us because we think it might be bloomery stuff, in which case, you know, we need a furnace, but it may not be, maybe just slag. What can you see there? Well, when you feel it, it's very, very dense. Yeah, it is, certainly is, yeah. It's also quite porous. It doesn't look like slag. Oh. I mean, could it be the bloom? It's either that or roasted ore. Let's have a look, see what you've got. Now, this is what I call a real expert. Someone who'll look at a lump of crud like this and tell you what it is. I, I would be thinking more towards roasting half, having looked at right. that. So that means you can really take all that out then, yeah. doesn't it? So we can get That's on. Good. Yeah. That's pretty efficient. You didn't even use your suitcase. I didn't even need the suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> We'll keep digging to make sure, but it looks like what we've found is remains of where they've been roasting the ore like this to prepare it for smelting, 
and the actual furnace won't have been far away. It's a great result. We now know this enclosure is a Roman iron smelting area and we can now identify what looks to be another similar enclosure just here. But with time almost up, how does our posh bathhouse fit into the story? We know we have a building that collapsed when the site fell out of use in the 4th century, but it's proving tricky to interpret. Sorry, could I just... Um, there appears to be another stone on top of this one, which makes me think perhaps we might have a, a robbed wall as opposed to floor. So, that's, um, so now that's a wall, not a floor? It, yeah. So um, I'm, sorry. I'm on the wall now. Good, so you're on the wall, <laughs> yeah, and I'm but, inside. But I'm still over the floor of another room. Possibly. So you've actually got a wall running with... That still means that could be a door jam, yeah. and that looks like the corner of where there was a door. Ah. So there's a room there, and there's a room there. But no wall. Wall has gone, robbed away. A lot more work's needed here, but we can get some idea of the extent of the bathhouse from the size of this earthwork. And if our theory is right about the link with Castor, then it's possible that our bathhouse was laid out like the one shown here in Artis's picture, which means that we're talking about a building that would have looked something like this. It was probably a standalone facility used by the official overseer on what would have been a state-controlled iron working site. Our dig certainly given me a newfound respect for this man, Edmund Artis, who was clearly a very good archaeologist for his time, but died before he could publish his written reports. His map of the archaeology drawn in 1828 has proved to be largely accurate, and it's not just the buildings, but also the pits he recorded that are key to understanding this site. Goodness me, it's a journey to the centre of the earth. <laughs> What we now know is that in Roman times, a lot of the rubbish was being thrown in these pits. So basically, this pit was open at the same time that those buildings were being occupied and, and used. And this looks a bit clayy to me, so is that what they're going for, the clay? Yeah, there's no sign of ironstone or any bands of iron in, uh, ironstone in this at all, so it must be clay for some purpose. And the, the little sort of pock marks and things I can see in there, is this sort of root activity? Well, some of it is, but some of it, some of these dark patches, if you carefully clean them back, you can actually see ads marks or picks marks where they've actually levered the clay out from this pit. Fantastic. We now know not all these pits were dug for iron ore. Many, like this one, would have been dug for clay to build and repair the iron smelting furnaces. So at the end of three days, we can now picture this long-lost Roman settlement as it must have looked in its heyday around 200 AD. What's been hidden in these woods is a massive iron working site with the furnaces and ore roasting pits on the slightly higher ground while the mining was going on here, chasing the seam of natural iron ore. The workshops and living quarters were not far away and were very much second class as mentioned by Edmund Artis but there was at least one fancy Roman building, a bathhouse, situated well away from the industry here on the eastern side of the site. But our story is not quite over because for the next few hours our archaeologists will be measuring, recording, taking photographs and eventually they'll write a proper archaeological report on this site. Which is really rather nice because we'll be finishing the job that Edmund Artis, for whatever reason, didn't complete himself. And then when we've all finally gone, nature will take over this whole site again. Just as it did nearly 2,000 years ago. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.